it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Bill Williams of SwaneeDental.com. He's in Swanee, Georgia. You probably know him of the uh, $5 million mastermind group. That's, that's what, right, Howard. That's what you call your group. Dr. Bill Williams has served his patients with compassion and understanding since 1975. We believe your experience does make a difference. He is a master of the Academy of General Dentistry and a master of the International College of Craniomandibular Orthopedics, as well as a team dentist for the Gwinnett Gladiators for 11 years. You can go to his website and check on some amazing before and after photos of Atlanta Extreme Makeover patients and deserving Diva Smile Makeovers. Uh, Dr. Williams is the dental director for Kenya Medical Outreach Dental Missions with annual mission trips to Kenya from 2001 to 2011. He has 2005 and 2009 Honduras dental missions and 2008 Tanzania mission. Uh, and he's also has a uh, 920 AM talk radio show, Atlanta Dental Expert, about dental implants and cosmetic dentistry. When you, did, when you went to Tanzania, did you climb Mount Kilimanjaro? We danced around Kilimanjaro, but we did not climb it. We were all over Moshi. We had uh, a spiritual mission that week, and we had prayer meetings and healing sessions all over Tanzania around the mountain. Well, I feel like a very bad monkey because I was asked to go to a, a mission trip in Tanzania, and I said, no, I'm too busy. I can't go. And then my buddy called me back. He said, are you kidding, dude? It's at the base of Kilimanjaro. We'll do the mission for ten, for a week, and then we'll go climb Kili for a week. And I said, okay, I'm ready to go. Then I felt bad because the only reason I went did a mission trip is for a chance to climb Kili. That, God, that was just, the, Tanzania is so beautiful. I love the country. I love the Maasai Mara and the Serengeti Plains. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. So let's, where, where do you want to start? Um, you ran a TMJ framework residency for 10 years in Atlanta. Um, and which was an outgrowth of the Cranial Mandibular Society. Tell, talk about that. You know, my, my mentor was Justin Jones, Dr. Jones, and uh, we gathered together a group of about 10 or 11 dentists here in Atlanta. Uh, you may know a, a lot of these guys, Mike Durkus, Larry Tilly, uh, some of the highlight guys in TMJ over the last two decades. So we formed a study club, the Atlanta Cranial Mandibular Society, and uh, learned from people like Harold Gelb and Barney Jankelson and Weldon Bell, uh, all the people that were somebody back then. Well, and go ahead. Over, over time, we just kept it together for 10 years. Well, you know, I always I always tell dentists that, you know, if you got 10 pediatric dentists, there'd, there'd almost be no controversies among them. If you got 10 endodontists together, they pretty much agree on everything. But you get 10 TMJ experts together, they almost don't agree on anything. And you're a big fan of uh, Barney Jankelson, and neuromuscular has probably got to be the most controversial TMJ camp in occlusion today. Why, why is that? It's because the condyles have a different definition depending on which camp you're in. And some people base their philosophy off of uh, anatomical points and some base it off of muscular points. And it's hard to risk, reconcile the two. We used to go to Chicago on a regular basis and have what we call the Galactic Mandibular Wars. And the American Equilibration Society would meet, and they would have opposing sides to get up and talk about which one was right and which one was wrong. So this was the uh, the event of the 80s was to go up to Chicago and debate TMJ. Now, would you say that Peter Dawson's message is that it's purely um, occlusion, anatomical teeth, and almost no muscular or psychiatric stresses? Would you say, is that a fair sum summary of Peter Dawson's camp? Point yeah, I, like, I learned a lot about Peter Dawson from dental school, and from the first five years of practice, I was practicing what Peter Dawson does. And I also learned what Barney Jankelson was doing, and so I married the two of those concepts. And healthy joints get treated one way, diseased joints get treated a different way. So I'm always consulting the muscles to see exactly what they want to do, and then we build the occlusion based on what's best for the patient. Okay, how many years have you been practicing? Forty-two. Okay. 42. So a lot of kids come out of school and a lot of fans of this show are young, young kids under 30 commuting to work. And a lot of them say, okay, um, Dr. Williams, I just came out of school and I have limited continuing education budget and, and I could be, uh, going to learn TMJ, TMD at Panky or, um, you know, Koi, Spear, uh, many, many places. Um, but I could, 
go off to learn Invisalign. I could go off to learn sleep apnea. I could go off to learn how to surgically place implants. I could go off to learn same day dentistry and CAD CAM. And I can't learn all those things at once. They want to learn them all eventually. But would 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 you do you think uh, cranial mandibular disorders is a good place to start, or would you if you had three hundred fifty thousand dollars of student loans, would you put that on the back burner for a while? Would you do something else first? How how important was your cranial mandibular uh, education to your uh, career? Well, it, it was the first thing that I started to learn as I got out of school. We called it occlusion back then. And it morphed, it morphed into TMJ. In, in school, we didn't know much about TMJ and TMD disorders. But I would put my eggs in that basket first as far as understanding occlusion and how to work with the articulation of the joints because everything else is going to be based off of that. You can't do orthodontics very well if you don't know where the jaw is supposed to be. I mean, you got to move the teeth to the right place. Well, a lot of TMJ experts um, around the, the world aren't big fans of the average orthodontist. They, 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 a lot of them believe the average orthodontist doesn't even get it. They, they think orthodontics blows out the curve of speed, the curve of Wilson, moves them from canine guidance to group function, and leaves, uh, leaves cases in a, in a lot of the, the average case. Uh, they're, they're not big fans of orthodontists. What, what would you say to your experience? Well, orthodontics moves things into the ballpark, but it, it takes a, an occlusion approach to finalize every case. So I don't think orthodontics can be quite as accurate to get to the final place. You need an understanding of where the joints should be and move the teeth to, to match to where the joints want to be. So orthodontics is an adjunct, not the end point. Well, do you think a lot of ortho, what percent of orthodontists finish the case in an occlusion that it's acceptable to you? I've seen a lot of uh, good orthodontics, and I've seen a lot of poor orthodontics. So I would say about 50-50. 50-50? Mm -hmm. and, and you talked about uh, TMJ being occlusion and joints. We've talked about a muscular component. Do you, think, do you think much of TMJ is a psychiatric component? No. I've practiced 41 years, and about 98% of my patients have been healed without even addressing the psychiatric component. I'm not a big fan of the psychiatric wing of the TMJ issue. That is that is interesting. Um, so I want to I want to talk about your five million dollar mastermind group where you you took you started a practice and went from zero to five million in ten years. So talk about so you had a, a previous practice before. So talk talk about your journey and your five uh, M mastermind group which you hold at your house. I went to Stone Mountain right out of school and started off in a small little office in a strip shopping center. And I, and I practiced there for 23 years. In Stone and Mountain? I, yeah. What's right that, a suburb of Atlanta? It is. And uh, I, st I was there for about 23 years, and I built a 15-operatory practice there, but I only got up to a million and a half practice dollars when I sold it and moved. And I started over at, at age 48. And so... The good thing is I knew how to do dentistry, and I moved to a nice area and started practicing in a 1,200-square-foot place, and we soon moved to a 3,000-square-foot place and, and expanded mm -hmm. that to an, another 10 and then another 15. So we ended up with 15 operatories again. In 3,000 square feet? No, in okay. 10,000. Oh, so you started off 1,200. How many ops in 1,200? Two. Two, and then you moved to 3,000. 3,000. With how many ops? Five. Five ops. And then I expanded that to 10 ops, then I expanded that to 15. F 10 ops and then 15 ops? Right. And so over 10 years, we moved it up. And so we were at $5.8 million when we kind of said, this This is kind of an unusual growth period. We didn't see too many people growing at that pace. So we, we kind of wrote a book about it called Marketing the Million Dollar Practice and um, kind of cataloged all the marketing steps we went through to get there. And and do you, do you think a lot of that was macroeconomics? I mean, were you in a place of Atlanta, Georgia, that was just booming and building 100 homes a month in your zip code? Or do you think it was just uh, business principles? Well, we were the only practice in, in our area growing at that rate. So it was partly business principles. It was a good place to be as far as growth. So I, I did have 150 new patients a month for some months. 
but most of it, if you look around the neighbors that were not growing, it was basically good business principles. We, we found the, the internet during that period of time, Howard. You know, that I, the internet didn't exist in the, in the 80s and 90s. And so we found the internet in 1997. And we started marketing, putting a website up. Man, you beat me a year. Dentaltown was 98. Yeah, I was looking at Dentaltown when it first came up. I was looking at bulletin boards in 1992. 1992 bulletin boards. Yeah, I had businesses in uh, Costa Rica and Venezuela and Greece built off of bulletin boards and email. Wow. Back in the old days. Yeah, and I always look back and say, if I had to do Dentaltown over again, I wouldn't have started it till 2001 or 2002. I mean, I would lecture every weekend in 98, 99. I'd get all excited. Oh, my God, I got 100 docs. How many of you guys are on the Internet? One hand goes up. And I'd say, what's your email address? I said, you have email? And he goes, yeah. Well, what, what is it? Oh, I don't know. It's written down somewhere. But it was about 2002 before dentists actually started adopting the Internet. Yeah, so I had a five-year head start on that one. And, and we were actually webmasters for many of the dentists around the country. Wow. And, and so, um, so your book, um, let's uh, talk about that on Amazon. Um, is, that, is that where you recommend to get it, on Amazon? Yeah. Yes, right next to yours, Howard. Marketing the Million Dollar Practice by Dr. Bill Williams. All, all reviews are five-star. Talk about uh, that book. Uh, I, I always say... I have a five. I have one that's three-star. I, I don't not not on not right now it's right now, right well, now they're the all they're all the, five. But anyway, the, um, you know I I've had four kids and I've written three books. And I tell everyone writing a book's like having a baby. I mean it, it's a nine month process. So what 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 was the journey of your book? What made you uh, write it? Uh, why did you write it? And what would my homies learn if they went to Amazon dot com and Googled uh, marketing the million dollar practice by Dr. Bill Williams? Well, what happened was I started writing blogs, uh, newsletters to my friends in dentistry about what was happening in this growth period where I was going from zero to five million. And I was cataloging what I was doing each month. And those things added up over a couple of years into some pretty nice um, chapters for a book. So I put it all together with a, a beginning and an ending. And we ended up with a book in, in 2011. And I kind of published it for good in 2012 and uh, it came out on September 11th of all days on, on the, the September 11 2001 12 oh the year after 911 yeah 2012 yeah so it came out and uh, it went to the number one on Amazon and it stayed there for a year and then it's kind of went down to two or three or four so it's in the top 10 since then and basically, I, I outlined 27 ways to add half a million dollars to your practice every year. So every chapter is one of the marketing steps we took to grow our practice. I love, uh, I love the quote, um, Dr. Williams shows exactly why it's better to copy genius than to invent mediocrity. I mean, is that, I mean, I, when people say, uh, oh, you're smart, I'm like, really? Well, then why did I have to go to, to nine years of college and read 1,000 nonfiction books? I mean, all, yeah. you know, all my best friends are dead and in a book. Um, so, so talk about, uh, talk about these, these steps. So it's 29 steps to add half a million to your practice. That's right. I mean, I, I, I did things that were really macro and some mi minor things that were very micro like uh, coffee news. It's a little uh, newspaper that goes out to the local merchants and you put your ad on it. And so I wrote a um, chapter on coffee news how to get your name out in your local community. I, I wrote about dental missions and how there's fallout from doing dental missions. We've been going all over the world doing missions for a lot of years. And what happened, I found, was people started noticing it. And we would be getting articles in the newspaper, in magazines, we'd have articles, we have TV shows that would talk about our um, trips to Africa. And we got to be known in Atlanta as the missions dentist. And so we kind of own the space of the good guys in town who go do trips to Africa. There's a lot of fallout from that, a lot of good fallout. It's, it's karma. I mean, it, there's just so much of what you push out just comes back, don't you believe? It's true. And, and I don't it's, mean that in some spiritual uh, way. I mean in reality. I mean, what you, what you 
push out, you get back. I mean, if you greet someone with a big smile, they smile back. If you well, people people love to go to the dentist who gives back. I mean, that's what people like. They like the dentist who has a generous heart. Now you're giving away your age because in your bio you talk about the Million Dollar Roundtable where you used to lecture for Quest seminars. You have to be our age to know what Quest seminars was. Was that really the first practice management group? That was my breakout session that I was sitting there listening to Ron McConnell talk. Ron McConnell he, of Quest. Yeah, you know, Gary McLeod and Ron McConnell broke me free. And um, Bill Blatchford was in the group with us, teaching us. And we... We got the book Think and Grow Rich. We got exposed to Omer Reed, and I never was the same. You know, he shows that little picture of the grasshopper in a jar with a lid on it, and he says, this is dental school. And then he takes the lid off, and the grasshopper learns to jump out. After hitting his head on the top of the roof for so long, he finally discovers he can jump out. And Quest is what set me free. I, I learned to be a businessman and think outside the box just from that, that year in 1981. I, I had one of the biggest honors last weekend. I lectured in San Francisco on New Year's Eve, and Omar Reed went to the lecture. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. how, how cool is that? Because when I got to school in 87, I was going to his lectures, and he, he was that, that person for me in 1987. And, and uh, he was up there, and I uh, got to spend time with my boys. He is such an amazing man. Um, so the, the founders of Quest were Gary McLeod, M-C-L-E-O-D. That's correct. And who was the other guy? You said Bill Blasford. Ron, and, Ron McConnell. And were those guys dentists? Yeah. Ron was a pediatric dentist who did uh, dental implants and orthodontics. And where was he? Oregon? Dallas, Texas. Dal and is he, still, does he, is he still teaching? Is he around? What's he do? He just retired a year or two ago. But, but would you say historically those were the first practice management guys in dentistry? Well, they were, not, they were not the first. Dick Barnes was in there with them, and uh, he was a disciple of Omer, of course. And uh, they were the first ones that I got in touch with, though. I was strictly clinical. I was going to Pete Dawson and Barney Jankelson and Harold Gelb, and I was doing clinical until 1981. Give, give, that, give away more pearls of your book. Well, I teach 10 different ways to add 500,000 to your um, to your practice, and it, it takes a lot of strategies. And so decathlon dentistry is one of them. You have to become a decathlete, do all 10 parts of dentistry. A lot of people call that the uh, super generalist, but I call it decathlon dentistry. And decatha is, de deca is 10? Ten different disciplines in dentistry. You and know, what, what are what are the ten different disciplines in dentistry that you think you have to do to add a half a million dollars to your practice? Well, you can do it easier if you know ten because that's how many there are: restorative, endo, oral surgery, implants, uh, cranial bridge, TMJ, uh, sedation, and perio. That might be ten. That's a restorative endo oral surgery implants crown and bridge TMJ sedation perio. You're, you're you missing two. Would pediatric be one? You could throw in pediatrics as one, although pediatrics has all the other stuff in it. It's just to age. I know pediatrics about, is especially about, for little people. You could throw in lasers if you want to be kind of a specific technique. So uh, once you're a decathlete, you can do anything that walks in the door. You don't have to refer it out unless you choose to. That's a huge, a huge opportunity because you only have to have half as many new patients if you can do all the services. So your marketing cut, budget's cut in half. So I want to ask you about sedation because one of the biggest things that these uh, kids are hearing about is uh, CAD CAM dentistry. And the, the, the makers and manufacturers that always talk about same day dentistry. And I always say that, um, you know, my, this, this will be my 30th year. This is, this is 2017. So I opened up September 21st, 87. So this will be my 30 year. And if I tell someone they need a root canal or a crown, half of them go straight to cost. Well, how much is it? And I don't get paid. You take my insurance. Can I finance this? The other half go to fear. I'm afraid. I don't want to get a shot. Can you knock me out? Do you have laughing gas? I only hear, well, you know what? I, I'll do it if I can get it done in the same day. I mean, I get that like once a decade. 
I've had that like three times. And all three times I was able to call my lab. And since I don't abuse that, I'd say, well, if I just, you know, can, can we get this back? They leave tomorrow or whatever. Um, but how important has sedation dentistry been in building a $5.8 million practice in 10 years from zero to 5.8? I got trained in uh, oral conscious sedation with docs, and I used the uh, pill rather than the IV. Now, I do have two associate dentists that came with me became my partners that do IV sedation. So I do, th I think IV is essential for the long term. but I've only used the pill. So we say nice with tongue in cheek, we say come to Swanee Dental and chill with the pill. And what's the pill? Trazolam. I'll use a cocktail that is uh, diazepam the night before, and I'll use uh, trazolam an hour before the appointment, and then I'll use hydroxazine and trazolam when they arrive at the office. And so I'm titrating them to the perfect uh, level of sedation. And I've done 99% of my sedations successfully with those three drugs. From a business point of view and an ethical, moral point of view, how, how, how dangerous is the is, is oral sedation? I mean, it seems like with, in the era of social media and Facebook, uh, anytime someone passed away, we've had a case last year, one was in Hawaii, one was in Texas. And my God, it get they literally get a million views on on Facebook. How, yeah, you know, how how frightening or risky or scary is that? Yeah, I don't do any of the IV sedation, so I'm never in danger. There's never been, to my knowledge, a death by oral conscious sedation. The DOCS protocol, particularly, doesn't lend itself to that much danger. Now, uh, there may be one I don't know about, but I've never heard of one. Over two million treatments, and not any. Fatalities, but your partners do IV sedation. Does that? They, they're trained and have very good techniques, and uh, they've never had any problems. And we do hear about IV sedation causing problems, but we've not seen it. The ones they usually have are in, in pediatrics. Yeah, yeah, small pill. But but would you? But to some kid listening to you right now, they're they're 25 years old. She's commuting to work at Aspen. Someday she wants to own a practice by herself, would you, would you recommend that she goes to docs? Absolutely, I think that's the safest and the best training you can get for oral conscious sedation, absolutely. And what, what, what was docs, uh, obviously they were upset with the last ADA meeting, they were tweeting out several messages per day about uh, some resolution, what, do, what was that all about? I'm not familiar with what the ADA was tweeting and what was docs upset, but I, I know that they're trying to put more regulations on dentists and limit what we can do. So I would I would not be in favor of limiting uh, the simple technique that is called the DOCS technique. Okay, so you said you would, of, of the decathlon, of the 10 areas, you said you would start with TMJ. Where, where would you recommend these kids go to learn about occlusion? Well, I think if you talk about one of those major places, uh, Spear, uh, Coys, uh, LVI, one of those places will give you a grounding, and you need to stick with it through the whole course of things, Dawson Academy, uh, Panky, any of those that are going to go all the way through it. And once you have gotten a clear picture of one thing, then you can go and start looking at what you can do to become more well-rounded. Don't stop with one place, though. That's my advice. So if you start one camp, finish them all. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, I did I did Dawson, Panky, Coys, LVI, Spear. You you can't go to any of those places and not learn a hell of a lot of information. They're all good. That's the one thing people should know. They're all good. It's just that they're not going to be able to give you the ability to treat every patient if you only know one technique. And you're also never going to go to one of these places and get all edumacated and never have to learn again. I mean, if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be learning on the last day of your career. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 becoming a sleep dentist in the truest sense of the word. The closer I get to the end of my career, you know, I've, I just passed the uh, diplomat exam for my sleep uh, apnea training. Okay, so, so if, yeah. if, if if TMJ was first, where would you go next? Would you go to sleep, sedation, perio, crown and bridge, implants, oral surgery, endo, restorative, pediatric, lasers, ortho? Where, where would you go next? Well, I went to ortho next. And I went to, because it was adjunctive to uh, TMJ, and I already felt like I knew Crown and Bridge and I already knew Endo and Perio. 
So I already knew those from dental school, I felt like. And I did have a good background because I was already doing all those surgeries. But really, my implant training, I started with Carl Misch and, the, and then the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, MexiCourse. So doing those things, uh, that was a good training. And, and I think implants is a good way to go because there's so much you can do when you know implants. So that, that makes so much sense. So after, after you learn all this TMJ at Dawson, Panky, Coys, LVI Spear, you're really set to go into orthodontics. And that's an easy sell because Invisalign, I, I, would you say in yours and my career, the largest brand built in the consumer's mind in our career was Invisalign? It sure is. Because when There's we started, they already knew Colgate, Crest, Listerine. They already knew all that. But now it seems like any country you go to, the waitress and the bartender are asking about Invisalign. I mean, from Soweto to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, they, the whole world. So you uh, are you doing much Invisalign or are you doing uh, brackets or what, what are you doing? Well, I've done – bracketing is about 50% of what I do and Invisalign is 50%. And I've got Invisalign cases that I've done in – patients that lived in Australia and England. So it's very good for travelers that want to come in and get it and get it out. But wires and braces are still 50% of what I do. And I'd say every orthodontist that I personally know is still about 80% brackets and 20% Invisalign for the orthodontist. But as a family practice, you're 50-50 Invisalign and brackets? About that. Yeah. And what, what do you say to the TMJ people who say, I don't, I, or Invisalign can't be good because you're putting something in between the teeth. You're putting a space. So if you put a millimeter between the molars, that's got to be a couple millimeters on the incisors. But just you can't do you can't do orthodontics when you're putting something in between a space in between their teeth. What would you say to those people? Well, if you know how to work with Invisalign, there's a way to uh, deal with the eruption capability, and you can grow teeth up or you can hold them down. So there's ways to deal with that in the Invisalign techniques in the uh, G7 especially. So did you ever go to Costa Rica and see their headquarters? I've been to Costa Rica twice, but I've never been to the headquarters. Yeah, Glidewell's down there and um, Invisalign's down there. I heard that's a really, really neat place to go. So after TMJ, you went into orthodontics uh, and you recommend, uh, for the Invisalign, there's a gazillion Invisalign courses. Who, did, who would you recommend going to to learn a fixed bracket? I went to the United States Dental Institute, USDI. Right. Five-year program when I was there. It's now about a two-year program. So USDI, can you text me that? Um, are they still doing that? I believe they are. I believe there's some of the people that took the original work and has kept it going like 25, 30 years later. Yeah, my, my, my recommendation on that is um, the only board-certified orthodontist who's actually taught at UCSFS and University of Detroit and ran the orthodontic program was Richard Litt with uh, Force Faculty of Orthodontic Research. Um, I, I, I think everybody should um, get that because a lot of people are, are learning this short-term ortho, and I know that the board-certified orthodontists, they, want you, they think you should learn full ortho first before you start learning short-term ortho or Invisalign. What would you say to that? I think they're smarter to say that, and it, you know, you, you're better off if you learn the details before you start doing the easy cases. Trying to pick off the cherries off the tree and and not treat the whole occlusion can get you in trouble. I think if you know your background better before you treat, it, it is a better way to go. So then after TMJ, then after orthodontics, would the next thing you say, you said you already learned oral surgery, endo, and perio in school. So, so then, that, it, then implants. So next would be implants. So are you placing implants? Yeah, I've been placing since 1988. 1988. And, and I like it when uh, old timers like us remind these uh, kids who have their uh, all hyper and all excitable about something controversial that back in 88, the people placing implants were considered quacks, weren't they? Uh, some of us were thought to be. Well, I was I mean, placing sub, submandibular uh, implants. In subperiosteals. Other stuff. Subperiosteals. Ramus frames? No, I didn't do, but I trained on it, but I didn't, didn't do one. Uh, but I, I, like mean, the, I mean, when I, I was at the uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, the, the, the instructors used to call the one oral surgeon placed them a barbarian. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was, it was open. It was open. Uh, uh, and then when I came out here, 
in 87. Um, the, the, a lot of the locals were pointing at a finger at a guy across the street from me that was placing them, and they, they just thought he, that he should have his license taken away. I mean, and, and now... Yeah, I was one of the first... Yeah, I was one of the first general dentists who was allowed to put Brandenburg implants in place. No kidding. Talk, so did you meet Dr. Brandenburg? No, I was trained with Carl Mish, but, you know, Jack Hahn and Carl were right there with him using Brandenburg's technique. And so what system um, would you uh, recommend today? Well, I just got the um, um, interlock system. I just bought it. So I'm using interlocks right now, the Blossom. Interlock? But I use a, a lot of Nobel Actives. I use a lot of Bicons. Nobel um, Active. Bicons. Bicons out of uh, Boston? Yep, they're Boston-based. And Noble, um, Noble, Noble Active. Noble yeah. Active. And who makes the Interlock? Uh, Interlock's the name of the company. I don't know. That's the name of the company. Okay. So, and, uh, so, they're they're okay. popular among some of the higher-end uh, implantologists around the world. But, but what if some kids listen to you and say, Dr. Williams, you're, you're a rich, older guy. You got three systems. I, I can only afford to start with one. If, if they said, I want to start with one, what would you say? Well, just start with any of them that they feel comfortable with because they're all the same, pretty much. They don't have that much difference in the result. I've got, you know, Implant Direct I use. I've got ABB. I've got OsteoReady. So any of those that you want to use, a lot of OsteoReady, you know, that Brady Frank's got some pretty good ideas. You know Brady? Oh, yeah, out of Seattle? Yeah, he's up there in Oregon. In Oregon. Medford, Oregon. And he's, he's got some simple systems. And I use those quite a bit. So if you if you don't want to spend a lot of money, you know there's there's the lower price implant brand, and those work fine. Now, did now would you say that you need a CVCT? I have one. But I would you tell uh, someone starting out that it's mandatory or optional? It's uh, optional, but I I would not place one comfortably without having a thick comb beam. Yeah, I, I I remember back in the day when I was uh, going to the missions to. You'd have a pano, and you'd think, oh, my God, I have an inch of bone to work with. And then you lay the flap, and it'd be some paper-thin knife-edge thing. And by the time you smooth it down, you lost half of it. Um, yeah, I, I go to practice to put the implants in now. I'm not nervous. I know what I'm going to find everywhere, and I know where the concavities are. That's the biggest deal. Most of us don't know where the concavities are unless we have a comb beam. And would you surgical guide or freehand? I've used three surgical guides in 40 years. <laughs> so I don't like them. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them, but I don't like them. Well, you know, in my experience, every dentist I know who's over 50 and is placed over between 1,000 and 10,000 implants, they never use a surgical guide. And yeah, then you I meet every dentist that's an instructor who's under 40, and they just insist that it's mandatory or you, you just can't do it. And the bottom line is if you're uh, – it's just as simple as that. 50 and over, they don't use them. 40 and under insist on them. Yeah, so I don't ever use them anymore. I tried them out when they first came out, and that's probably why I don't use them now. So what would you say to some 40-year-old um, um, person out on the circuit saying that uh, if you don't use the surgical guide, uh, you're a hack, and your implants aren't placed right, and you're, uh, you're crazy? Hey, come look at mine. They stay in there as long as yours, probably. So, uh, so why, why, do you think, what, why, do, why do you think implants fail? Implant cement, uh, Cranor Bridge cement, um, Crestal bone loss is the number one reason they fail. And that's probably related to uh, hygiene. It's related to uh, maybe not having the interface just perfect. Some of the implant companies have different types of uh, systems that just don't, they're not very kind to the gingiva at the collar. And so I see crestal bone loss on a number of them. But, but if you're young and you're listening to us, okay, um, older guys have seen a lot of uh, top recommended stuff fail. I mean, we saw Ivoclair's uh, Targus Vectors. We saw Horace Calzer's Art Glass. We've, uh, I mean, I was taught in dental school to use Dicors and cement them with Duralon. I mean, it was a 100% failure rate. Um, but how crazy is it that in 2016... I can buy five different, I can buy a half dozen different cements 
that are called dental implant cement to cement crowns on implants with an ADA seal of approval. How, how, how bizarre is that? When, when you talk to anybody and say, what, what is the biggest problem in implant failure? And they say the implant cement. And it's like, well, how could it be the implant cement if it says dental implant cement and it has the ADA seal of approval on it? It's not supposed to be where you get it. It's supposed to be up under the crown, not under, under the gums. <laughs> but but Car Carl Mitch was saying, though, that uh, zinc phosphate, if you had excess cement, it wouldn't cause those problems. And he's gone back to the very original zinc phosphate cement, which dentists don't like to use because it's harder to mix. I mean, you got to break it into four, then the one four. You know, it's it's a harder mix. But my gosh, wouldn't you think that uh, uh, um, that I mean, to have a cement based on that, you're a hundred percent perfect, like some droid, uh, is not realistic. Would would you recommend going back to zinc phosphate if that's what Carl's saying? No, I'm not going back to zinc phosphate. <laughs> and why? Why? Why not? I didn't like that. It was hard to mix. Yeah, but that's the assistant's problem. That's not our problem. We're the dentist. The assistant mix that. <laughs> that's Jan's problem, not mine. That's true. But 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 if if you have it um if you have an, an excess deal, I mean it's it's so radiopaque, it shows up so easy, it flicks off so easy, but it doesn't cause the gums to go crazy. It might be worth looking at then. Yeah. Um, amazing. And when you when you're looking at implants, um you know, when I said, why do implants fail? You said implant cement. A lot of the younger kids are thinking, they're, they're confused because they hear, well, don't put them in smokers or diabetics or fat people or, you know, blah, 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 blah. But it seems like the people that show up in your practice at Phoenix, Arizona need implants. Well, the reason they need implants is because they ain't done anything right half their life. I mean, they, they didn't have the best home care. They smoke, they drink, uh, you know. Um, so w w how do you help a young child treatment plan when everything her school said, don't do it in this person, is the only person showing up needing implants. I don't, I don't make any bones about putting implants in any particular person, and they all work. So I'm not worried about smokers. I'm not worried about control diabetics. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. I'll place them, and I'll have the caveat, if these people have diabetes, they're going to fall apart faster than those who don't. If they smoke, they're going to fall apart faster. But I don't have any problem putting them in as long as they maintain them and clean them. Yeah, good advice. And and the, the trick with diabetes has got to be controlled diabetes. So so you do, so um you recommend uh, uh you gave four names for implants: uh, Brady Frank, Interlock, Noble Biocare Active, Bicon, um, out of Boston. Um, would you um? Where would you go next? You said um, lasers. Um, Cos cosmetics. You know, cosmetics? I, I didn't think I was a bad dentist, but I, I started seeing uh, things coming out of American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry in the uh, mid-90s. And I, and I was asked to join that as a founding member, and I never did, back when it started with uh, the cameras up in uh, Wisconsin. And I wish I now, had joined. Who started that? What was his name? Jack Cameron. Jeff Chris Hammer. And, yeah, and he started, God, he started so many things, the AECD. Can you remember some of the things he started? I think he started three or four. Yeah, he was amazing. And American, uh, his son, uh, Chris Cameron, Chris along with Lee Osler, started the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. That's been five years that's been started now. So I would get trained in cosmetics. I would go to the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry or one of the similar academies you're not a cosmetic dentistry based on what you know. You got to go to the specific training. And I, I got 10 years of cosmetic training by going to their annual meeting and to our local affiliate, the Georgia Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Very valuable. Yeah. Maybe uh, a whole lot better dentist. Yeah. The ACD, their annual meeting is in Vegas this year. Same time our annual townie meeting is. We're right across the street from each other. So just go to Vegas and go to one of those two. Uh, yeah, I, the AACD, that's got to be the cream of the crop of cosmetic dentistry education, isn't it? It is. And I'm in the town with Ron Goldstein and Deborah King. So, you know, I've got to show up and be uh, holding myself to at least the same level as they are. And so it's good to have people in your area that you learn from. Now, Ron Goldstein, Goldstein and Garber, didn't they, they, they sold their practice to Heartland last year. And they did. I, did they retire? No, they're still working every uh, couple of days. They don't work all the time. So Goldstein, uh, Ron Goldstein and uh, Gar what was Garber's name? Uh, uh, 
Uh, David Garber. David Garber. So and, was that was that a good move for them selling that to Heartland? It was very good move. Because they when get, boys get as big as you and Goldstein and Garber, you're not no, going to be but, able to sell that to some kid that walks out of dental school. And that's the no, one that's, thing I noticed that was the best thing about uh, Rick Workman of Heartland is that some of my friends that had four million dollar practices out in the middle of nowhere, Texas. I mean, they they had an illiquid asset. I mean, they, they, and then Rick Workman and Heartland come along and say, yeah, we'll buy it. And it's basically like, that's the only buyer for a, pra- I'd say for, would you say that if your practice gets to $3 million, the pretty much Heartland is about your, your only way to liquidate that thing. I mean, I mean, who like, like your practice, like what, what is your practice up to right now? It's past six now, right? 6.2. So 6.2 million. How many kids walking out of dental school could qualify for a, Six point two million dollar loan from Bank of America or Wells Fargo. Zero. I had three associates that I offered the practice to when I was ready to sell it, and they would not do it because they couldn't see themselves doing it. They could have done it, but they didn't see themselves doing it. And so the corporate uh, entities are the only out for a big practice. So, do you ever talk to Rick Workman as a as an exit strategy? Uh, because. Uh, if you, I mean, you've you've been doing this forty two years. Do you, do you want to retire? Or are you gonna are you are you gonna practice till forever? I'm looking, I'm looking over at my wife because uh, she's already cashed Rick's check. She's already what cashed what? Rick's, Rick's check. check. Rick Workman's check. <laughs> I, I joined Heartland myself four years ago. So you did sell to Heartland. I did. Oh, okay. I did not know that. So you sold to Heartland four years ago. I was there before uh, Goldstein Garber sold. So you sold it to them, and now you're working for Heartland. I am. We'll talk about that. Would, uh, it, four, it was four years ago. And it when is w- and what did you when you sold? How long did you have to work for him? Five years. Two. So yeah. you could have quit two years ago, and you stayed on. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a lot better. When you're the seller, it's a very good situation because you get to uh, name your hours. You get to work when you want. You don't have to continue working full time. And that's the exit strategy for the guy who's been working full time that they love. They got loyal patients. Your productivity goes way up when you don't have to work but two or three days a week. Now, and, and, does your wife want you to retire completely or do you, or do you want to stay in there? She wants me to keep working so that I can still fund her lifestyle. I think that well, right. I, most dentist wives that I've, that I've <laughs> known for 30 years, they, they say that it's a, it, it's kind of like when a soldier comes home from, from war and he's been gone two years when he comes home, the, the wife is extremely stressed. I mean, you know, she had her life and now she's got this guy, back in and I've had so many, uh, it seems like most of the dentists I know that have practiced 50 years. Uh, the wife says, okay, uh, um, the founder of Denmap, Bob Ibsen, he was 80 year, 80 something years old, a gazillionaire. And Marcy told him, she goes, I, I don't care if you sell your practice, but you're still leaving the house Monday through Thursday, eight to five. I don't care what you do and where you go, but you're not going to be in my house Monday through Thursday, eight to five. So he uh, he had some volunteer homeless shelter dental clinic fixing up uh, battered, abused women in, in Southern Cal. So he would just go there and make uh, battered women look all beautiful and pretty uh, because basically he was kicked out of the house Monday through Thursday. I just thought that was hilarious and probably the secret to their 50-year marriage. Well, the best thing about Heartland buying us was the fact that she got to retire and she got to stop working because she was like, you know, head of the office. And uh, that was beautiful for her to be able to go home. And now I get to work two days a week, and I can and I can still do, um, you know, one hundred fifty thousand dollar business in two days. So that's enough to keep me going. That you do one hundred fifty thousand dollars of production on two days a week. Yeah. So you're working eight days a month doing one hundred fifty thousand production. Right. That's so what I was. Much- that's what I was telling you about. You know, we 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 put this five M mastermind together. And we have a topic called the ten thousand dollar a day dentist. And so, what I realized, Howard, was over the last ten years, I've been averaging ten thousand a day. Now, when I sold to Heartland, it went up to twelve or thirteen thousand a day, and 
fifteen thousand a day based on shortening the uh, number of, of days that I had to work in a week has more demand. Okay, so so, so um, how many hours is that ten thousand dollar day, and how many chairs are you working out of? I'm working out of three chairs primarily. Sometimes it'll flow into a fourth, and it's eight hours a day with an hour for lunch. So how do you do a $10,000 day? There's kids that just heard you say that and they just drove off the road. Oh, good. You know, they need to stop and listen because it's possible. If it's been done, it's probably possible, said Omer. So I show people how to do that. And you basically have five things you've got to accomplish. You've got to get your mindset right. You've got to have the team right. Your facilities got to be perfect. You've got to have the marketing for the inflow of patients. And you've got to have the capacity within yourself to deliver the product. And so when you've got those five things, and I write about that on LinkedIn. You, you can find a whole bunch of articles on LinkedIn. And um, what you have to do is understand that if it's probably possible and you know how to do it, that it can happen every day when the staff sets it up for you. So that's what I did. I, I, I gave the staff the job of booking me $10,000 every day. And if I go in and it's only seven, I'm going to find 3,000 more that needs doing. And so we just continually working for that number to show up every day. So how many articles do you have on LinkedIn about a $10,000 day? 43. Why don't you just spend like, there, there's a quarter million dentists on Dentaltown. Why don't you just, it only take you 20 minutes to cut and start one thread in practice. There's 50 forums, root canals, fillings, crowns, pediatric. Go to practice management and paste those 43 articles and that thread will probably grow to 10,000 comments over the over 2017. I'll do that. I'll put them into downtown. I would really, really like that because what I, what I like about that is, is if you're talking about how to do a $10,000 a day and I know what this kid needs to do to solve all of his problems is to go from 2,000 to 3,000 a day. But if you talk about going to 2000 to 3000 that's probably harder. But if you sit there and start talking about how to get to 10000 he'll probably run over 3000 without even noticing it's, 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 it's where I wanted him to be. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was sitting in the uh, preparation stage for my mastermind back in a year ago, January of 2016. And I was putting together my lecture that I was going to give the mastermind program. And I came up with a $10,000 a day concept. All I did was I looked at what I did every day, and I wrote down 50 things I did every day. And I put these into a list, and I divided them into uh, five things that I just read to you. The mindset, the team, the facility, the marketing, and the capacity. So those five things have 10 separate parts that uh, things I do every day or think about or put in place. Now, so, is this all in your book on Amazon, or is this in your mastermind group? It's not in a book yet. And the mastermind is about that, the $10,000 a day dentist. The book is about the marketing to build it up to the $5 million practice. So, I came up with the idea on the 10000 thing in the last year. So what, what if someone listening to this wants to join your $5 million mastermind group? How, how, how does that work? Well, they better hurry because it starts January 20th, three weeks from now. So it starts January 20th, um, and is the class size limited then, or? Yeah, we take nine dentists at a time. And is so it for I, 90 days or throughout the whole year? It's a year-long program, and we meet three times here in my house in Atlanta. Over the course of a year? Right. And Two, it's for nine people only? Nine people at a time. I can do more masterminds than one, but I can only do nine at a time. Rain, can we bump this up? Uh, podcast out we, we we tape you know we, we got a month in the queue but if you got to be at, they got to join by the 20th how many openings you got in your of your nine i got six openings i've got three they've already paid they're coming from uh, australia oregon idaho california but i have a you know i've got six places left and, and how much is it uh Depends on what you get. There's several parts to it, but anywhere between twenty-four and forty thousand. Twenty-four to forty thousand. And what's the website for that? Is that solsticedentaladvisors.com? Yes. Slash two thousand seventeen. 
Solstice. So is that the uh, so the winter solstice, December twenty first, shortest day of the year. The June twenty first solstice, longest day of the year. Is that what you mean by solstice? Yeah, it was it was based off of a, a study club that we were a part of called the Solstice Research Group, and uh, I started that along with Joe Ellis and Lee Osler and a whole bunch of other dentists around the country. About nine or ten of us got together every six months on the winter and the summer solstice. Well, you know what? If you started that thread and posted those you, that um, posted your say Howard, say Howard, say you just did a podcast with Howard and he asked me to do that. That way, no one's thinking you're spamming or or getting free advertising or whatever. Just say, hey, just did a podcast, with Howard. He wanted me to post my forty three articles on this and tell you that my uh, deadline for this year's twenty seventeen mastermind group is January twenty first. You said. January 20th and 21st is our first meeting, and then we'll meet again. And We'll do that, because if you started that thread and we push out this podcast tomorrow, you'll sell out your uh, your six seats. Okay, Howard, you want to come? Um, I, 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 well, I, I'll, I'll have to look at the dates and everything. That, that, that does sound uh, very, very, uh, very, very fun. Um, um, so, Solstice Dental Advisors. So, let, let's talk about the five things. You said got to have the right team, the right mindset, the right marketing, the right capacity, the right facility. Let's just take one at a time. Um, team, what, what, um, if I lined up a hundred dentists, I said, what keeps you up at night the most? It's always HR. It's always staff. They always have a pit in their stomach. They just, what would you say about that? Hire tens. If you don't have tens, make them tens. We hire sevens and make them tens. We get rid of anything that's a six or below. So we don't work with losers. We we work with winners. That's probably the biggest part of it. A lot of dentists just don't settle for the right person when they hire. Um, a lot of a lot of successful people like you, the the leadership has been growing for decades. How would you speed up the leadership qualities of a 25-year-old dentist that just walked out of school uh, in May, and she's five foot tall and 100 pounds? How, how can she just be a leader? Like, what's the fastest way to ramp her up to lead a team of people? Sit down in a meeting and set a vision. With her put team? Your, yeah, put your vision on paper and get buy-in for the team and tell them that this is the direction we're going and be the captain of your boat. You know, don't be at the effect of everything. Don't be an emotional wreck. Just learn to be a, a, a leader from the very beginning. Set the tone. Set the stage. Bring in the systems. Insist that this team learns your systems and hold them accountable to those systems. And one of the reasons we grew so big and so fast was because of the key performance indicators, the KPI. We, we measure everything and we, we understand why things work and when they don't work, we can fix them quickly. Do you believe in the old adage, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it? Absolutely. Yeah, so do I. I uh, also, also believe that staff who are not motivated by uh, playing the game probably are not going to win. So you, you, you need to have a game to play. And we always found that if we had a great game to play, we won huge. So we always took our staff to... Hawaii or to Whistler skiing or to Cabo San Lucas or Jamaica. We take them on a yearly trip because we want to win big. Everybody likes to play a game. Well said. And your Falcons are playing very well this year. We won't bring up my Arizona Cardinals because I'm so jealous of your Falcons. What about mindset? You said you got to have the right mindset. Is that, is that having the game plan? That's number one for me. Mindset means you believe you can do it. And so you have to set yourself up for success by having the belief in your own self that you're the best dentist in town, that you've got the best team in town. Your team has to reflect that to the patients. And as, as soon as the patients understand that you're the best in town, then everything else is downhill. You're not having to sell dentistry when you're the best. Now, if I, you think somebody next door is better, you know, you got to just you got to work uphill. Um, what's amazing is... Um, Muhammad Ali, after he's retired, was just such a humble man. But as we knew him, he was always, I am the greatest. And it turns out he was said, I was always saying that because I wanted to believe it. I had to say that all day long because I had to believe it. I, I wasn't saying that to you. 
I was saying that to the world to make me believe it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. And then as soon as that game was over and he was retired, he was the most humble, quiet, shyest guy around. That's just like you and me outside of dentistry. Yeah, we're humble. Yeah, I'm short, fat, bald, and humble. What Marketing. <laughs> um, a lot of people say that uh, they don't know what's changed more in our uh, several decades doing this, uh, especially a periodontics or dental marketing. Those, those, those uh, marketing has changed so much. I mean, when you and I got out, the pioneers were doing yellow pages. Um, what, what, what works in marketing today for you? Uh, Facebook is big and direct mail is still big. I've, I've got a thing called web centric marketing where everything points back to the website. And it used to be, I had a big advantage over everybody because I was early on. Now you got to have a big footprint in social media as well as the website. So I, I like Facebook number one. Um, I think it's funny where I notice that millennials are always saying direct mail that that's dead. It's dead because people are projectionists. They always project their own thoughts. So if you're a millennial and you think going out to the mailbox and throwing all that crap away, well, that's you. You're not a 50 year old, a 60 year old, a 70 year old, but every dental marketing expert I talk to says direct mail is still alive. And that if 99% of the people that receive it, think it's junk and throw it away. But 1% comes in, it's a slot machine. I mean, direct mail is one of those things where 99% of the market can hate it. And it's still a cash cow, isn't it? I get uh, as many from direct mail as any other thing I do other than direct referrals. We get 50% of our patients from direct referrals from patients. And the rest of it comes from direct mail, radio, TV, social media. And in social media, Facebook is the main player there? It is, by far. Because I notice you're big on LinkedIn, but you're not getting clients you from LinkedIn. Yeah, I work LinkedIn because of my consulting with dentists. You know, on LinkedIn, my bio... Uh, my, my profile says I'm the dental Batman. I'm a dentist by day, and that means I'm uh, Bruce Wayne doing the average dentist thing. But then at night, I'm Batman teaching dentists how to be wild. And what do you think of these low-life, scummy dentists who think Superman is greater than Batman? Don't you just want to smack them? No, Batman's a lot better. I Batman, know. He had a pal. You know, he had Robin. <laughs> There's just some things you can't teach a dentist. And Batman is number one. Um, so back to uh, facility and, um, and capacity is the last two. Um, talk about facility and capacity. Yeah, yeah bottlenecks. you got to get rid of your bottlenecks. And if you don't have enough chairs, you have a bottleneck. If you don't have enough staff people to run them, you got a bottleneck. And so the dentist that wants to be productive has to have enough chairs to put people to do the job at hand. And so you need at least four chairs and you need your hygiene space too. I know. I tell everybody that works at uh, Patterson, Shine, Benco, Burkhardt, I said, you know, you're in there trying to sell them a laser or CAD cam or all this stuff. And the number one thing I always see in every office is the dentist making 35 percent, staff's making 28, lab man's making 10, sundry's making six or seven, and everybody's standing around waiting for an operatory. And if you I mean, it's like. It's like, where is operatories on your cost? Why do I have, when you see labor, your number one cost was for the dentist or the staff, when you see labor waiting on a chair, and then I go up front and some toothache's on there. Well, can I come down now? And, I'm, and they're looking for an open chair. Well, I, I don't, I can't, uh, there's nowhere I can squeeze you in today. My God, why isn't there an emergency room? And then the dentist says, well, I'm too busy. Well, have you heard of no-shows and cancellations? And, uh, you know, so put them in there and... Half the time uh, that you can't see them, you get a no-show cancellation or someone doesn't get numb and you got to give them a booster shot. I mean, an extra operatory is the number one return on investment in most dental offices. Would you agree with that or disagree? Totally agree. You know, I try to consult with dentists in Australia or in uh, Great Britain. And the one thing they always try to tell me is we don't have enough room. They always have one or two ops is all they have. They, they can't do more dentistry because they don't have enough room. And so at least in the United States, we have more rooms. But sometimes it's in the mindset, the mindset of the dentist as to how many operatories they need. They think they can't afford to have another one. They cannot afford to have another one, actually. Yeah, I've been in uh, Australia, France, Italy, 
while some dentist is telling me that he doesn't have room for an operator, and it's like, dude, I've never seen a private office this big in America. I mean, not only could this, your office be a room, this office might be two hygiene rooms. Absolutely. And then one thing that's real funny over there in Great Britain, especially, is they might have five dentists working out of one office, and it has three operatories, and they yeah. rotate all through it. Yeah. So they're very, uh, they're very uh, under under facility. What's the word? Crazy. Poorly, they're poorly set up in their facilities, and they could do so much better. Well, I think after talking about Batman, we should. I think it'd be more accurate to say they're bat shit crazy. I mean, cause, because I, I've seen it in Singapore, Japan. It's like, okay, you got five dentists working out of a four operatory facility. Do you really think those operatories cost more than four or five doctors? I mean, show me on the grease board. Tell me how you think. I need to see how your brain works because this, and it'd be like, it'd be like a nuclear power, you know, our a service like dentistry or a restaurant your, your cost are people. I mean, it's, it's, it's labor lab supplies where the other, so our number one cost, 80% of our costs is variable costs, labor lab supplies, not fixed costs, uh, rent, mortgage, facility, operatories. Whereas the other end, like say a nuclear power plant, it costs $10 billion to build that nuclear power plant. That'd be like saying, well, we have to turn it off on Christmas because if we paid our workers on Christmas, we'd have to pay them double time due to union laws. Yeah, dude, after you bought a $10 billion re, uh, factory, your fixed cost is your whole model. No one gives a shit what the double time, triple time cost is of some guy running it on Christmas or New Year's. So so we're not a nuclear power plant of or an assembly line. We're a service, and our cost is labor, variable cost, labor lab and supplies. And I don't think, I, I, I bet you 80% of the offices that I see in any given year um, um, need one operatory. And usually by the time the dentist figures out they need an extra operatory, at that point, they usually, at that point, already need like two. Hey, Howard, I'll give you a good example on that same uh, vein. Marketing, the single best marketing you can have is a fixed cost. It's your sign outside on the road. Number one thing is what it looks like when people drive by. If you have a visible sign that's really attractive, you draw people in, and it doesn't cost you a penny more for the next 20 years. Great point. And I would end on one last thing because I, I try to figure out how my homies think because you got to get past how they think. And I think what they think, the reason they don't put in a chair is because they say, yeah, but I have four chairs and ha half the time I'm not even using two of them. And that is basically, think of a bank. There's 168 hours in a week. The, the drive through has got three lanes. They only use the three lanes on Fridays when everybody gets paid. The rest of the week, the other 160 hours are using one lane. And so your facility has to match the flow. So I don't care that you have four operatories and you almost never use one. That's matching total demand with total capacity. You have to match total demand with the total flow. So you might almost always have an empty room, but if there's two or three times a week, where you are down two rooms, your your capacity is not matching the extreme flows. That's accurate. You know, you want to staff for maximum efficiency and maximum patient flow. It's, and you want to build your facility for maximum usage. Okay, well, we went over time. Uh, you promised me an hour, and I'm already at an hour five. Final question. Um, what did you mean by the uh, – We you talked about the team, the mindset, the marketing, the facility. But what do you really mean by capacity? That's the great divider between the men and the boys, the girls and the women. Some dentists can do it and some can't. So I've had about 20 associates over 40 years, and I've watched people work real close up. And I've noticed that there's certain capacity that some dentists have to multitask and others can't. And so you have to know within yourself what you can do. You now you can train yourself to do some of these things. Multitasking is just one of them. But... If you can have a slow heartbeat and, and be in the middle of some difficult surgery, then your capacity is higher. But if you get nervous and sweat and worry, then your capacity is lower. Can you move around between the operatories? Can you multitask? Can you think about what's going on in room A, B, and C at the same time? 
And when you learn how to judge if you have the capacity to do that, then you become capable of, of having these big days. Can you see yourself doing $10,000 a day every day? Sure. And then I, I, I got to, sorry, I got to ask another overtime question. I can't uh, go without asking about uh, my local buddy, David Gergen, up the street from me here in Phoenix with his sleep apnea in the NFL. You're involved in that. I got involved with David this year, and I got uh, past the um, American Sleep and Breathing Academy's uh, diplomat exam this year. I came out to Phoenix to the Cardinal big event, and I was there to meet David Johnson and all the Cardinals. And the reason I came out was because we're going to do a big event for the Falcons here in a, about a month. And we're going to screen and treat all the Falcons and all the alumni of the NFL. See, being part of uh, David Gergen's Pro Player Health Alliance means that all the athletes from the NBA and the NFL will come through our office to be screened for sleep apnea. And by doing that, we're going to, we're going to place them at the – the headboard, you might say, they're going to be the bell cow to attract other people to our practice. And so this is basically a marketing plan that David's come up with to to showcase the NFL players so that all the common people will see that the dentists that work with the NFL know what they're doing to treat these kind of players. And how do, how do they get more uh, information on David Gergen? Gergen Gergens Ortho, G E R G E N S Ortho.com. Gergens Ortho.com. Yeah, you go to uh, ProPrayerHealthAlliance.com or you go to um, David Gergens Orthodontic Lab in Phoenix and they all connect to each other. Um, there's a real good story that, that David tells about how he saved Derek Kennard and Jetstream Roy Green, who are famous in the Cardinal Land how he saved them and gave them a new life by giving them a sleep appliance. And so uh, I got connected with those guys, and, and now we're working with people like Billy White Shoes Johnson, William Andrews, Julio Jones. And these guys are coming in our practice, and they're, they're a big-name people. And so we're playing off a of celebrity status to leverage to work with the NFL so that the people that drive the trucks that, that are the average citizens – We'll get their sleep apnea appliances at our office. And we did those three players. We did David Gergen and those players you just mentioned on a podcast about, what, six months ago, Ryan? Yeah, an amazing story. David Gergen is, is an amazing person. And uh, so the American Sleep and Breathing Academy Dental Vision ASBA, that's out of uh, Scottsdale, isn't it? It's the right ASBA. here, right there locally where you are. Yeah. Well, they're, they're up in Rich Scott's. I'm in the poor end. I'm, I'm down in Phoenix. Okay. Slumming, I see. I'd, I'd have to marry well to, to move up to Scottsdale. <laughs> <laughs> so you recommend joining the uh, uh, American Sleep and Breathing Academy? You know, there's one big reason to join it. There's a lot of great academies, but they're talking about making a specialty status out of, of uh, dental sleep disorders. And so that's one of the things that's going to happen. And people that are in that academy will have a leg up on some of the uh, things going on with being a specialty status. So they have their annual meeting right here in Scottsdale. Attend the Sleep and Wellness Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona, April 9 to 11. Are you going to be, or was that last year? I'll be there, the one coming up. When, when, when is the one coming up? Hmm, I think it's in April. It's in April? Okay, I don't know. well, uh, are you, come on, uh, count. next time you come out, you got to call me up. We'll do it. Yeah, call me up. That would be fun to see you guys. And, uh, and uh, again, um, your website that they should go to to find out the uh, mastermind group? SolsticeDental.com. Excuse me, SolsticeDentalAdvisors.com. That's advisors with the ORS. And slash 2017. And if you, if, you, if you start a thread on Dental Town, post all your deals, I'll get this out. We'll move you to the front of the queue and put it out tomorrow. And uh, deal? It's going to be good. I'll put them up tonight. All right, buddy. Hey, seriously, uh, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Uh, what an amazing man. And thank you so much for taking an hour out of your life and uh, sharing an hour with me and my homies today. I'm sure so many people just loved it. 
Howard, you were an inspiration to me. I saw you at the TBSC about 20 years ago, and you were inspiring me to get out and do it. So it goes both ways. I thank you. Ah, uh, thanks. And, and I had a, even Rick Workman said that. He said, Rick Workman said, I got the idea of Heartland listening to you at the uh, uh, Profitable Seminar uh, with uh, Woody Oaks in Destin, Florida. Hey, a lot of good things come out of small times. Yeah, but uh, yeah, dentistry is just fun. But again, thanks so much for sharing time with my homies today. You're welcome. Uh, and good luck with your Falcons. We're going to go all the way to the Super Bowl this year. Let's go. My God. Well, I, I might as well root for your team because I, I don't have a dog in this race. My Cardinals are done. So uh, I'll, I'll vote. I'll, I'll root for your Falcons. Okay. We'll see you there in Phoenix, and you come here to Atlanta. Okay. You got it.